Okay, so most of the evolution that we've talked about so far is evolution that most people can agree on. Um, even the people who say they don't believe in evolution and they don't think evolution is real, um, most people actually do agree with that part of the evolution. We call that microevolution. Um, <clears throat> Most people can agree that yes, changes have happened. Now there are definitely still people who insist that chickens were put on earth the way they are now um, and that all of that other evidence isn't true. That's their thing. In science, we talk about what we have evidence for. And so um, that evolution that we've talked about in the past, most people are actually all good with that. Um, the part where people start to kind of complain and get a little fidgety is with how the earth came to be and how sort of the current environment came to be. And so I'm just going to give you a really, really super fast rundown. Some of it is going to sound absolutely ridiculous. And the main reason it's going to sound so ridiculous is that I just can't give you the science that you need in order for it to make sense. I just need you to trust me that there are scientists who have done millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of research and spent all kinds of time and years and fantastic studies to find these things out. Um, so we do have evidence to back up all of these things that I'm going to say to you today, even though some of them sound really, really crazy. So I'm going to try to knock this out really quickly just to kind of get you the big ideas. So for 100 million years, that's kind of a long time. So for 100 million years, there were these little pieces of cosmic debris, meaning just all of this little sort of junk out in the uh, out, out in the out in space. And those pieces of cosmic debris attracted to each other. And one of the things we know is that all objects attract to each other. There's a gravitational attraction between all objects. We don't see that uh, in our daily lives for the most part because Earth has such a huge gravitational attraction that we just see everything getting pulled toward Earth. But there are actually gravitational attractions between me and my computer right now, for example. So for 100 million years, all of these little pieces were attracted to each other. And they became this sort of, I call it a lint ball, a cosmic lint ball. So this great big cosmic lint ball was floating around in space and it got hit by something. It got hit by something really, really big or a lot of something really, really big, but it got hit. And when two things get hit, what you get is a lot of heat. Some of that energy, some of that motion gets converted into heat energy. And so that giant collision created this huge amount of heat. And what that did is it caused everything in our little cosmic limp ball to melt because there was so much heat. So it's like if you took, you know, some big piece of metal and you got enough heat in there, it would melt and it would turn into goo. So we actually had this melted globe. So once we had a liquid, the different elements that were in that liquid rearranged themselves according to density. Kind of like if you have salad dressing and you shake it up, it's all good and everything looks really mixed together. But if you let it sit for a little while, it'll, it'll um, sort itself out and so then you'll have these layers. Well, that's what happened with the Earth. So the things that were the most dense um, sank to the point where they were in the middle. The things that were moderately dense sort of rose up a little bit. They cooled and they formed what's now the crust of the Earth. And then the least dense things rose up the most and they formed what we have as our atmosphere now. So as time went by, because of course that collision happened and then didn't happen again, Earth started to cool. So all of that heat energy started to evaporate. So about four billion years ago, solid rocks formed on the surface of the Earth. And that was just because of the cooling, because we went from liquid to solid. That's what happens when things cool off. We had volcanoes erupting, so some of that liquid core was kind of coming up and out between those uh, solid rocks. Comets and asteroids were still flying all over the place, and they were whacking into Earth. It was not a really friendly place to be. Um, so it was, it was kind of, you know, sketchy. But, of course, there was no life on Earth at the time, so nobody was all that upset. Uh, the Earth cooled off some more because, of course, more time went by. And we're talking about billions of years. We're not talking about 10 minutes. We're talking about billions of years. So 3.8 billion years ago, water turned into a liquid. It basically condensed out of the atmosphere. We know that hot water turns into gaseous water. If we let that gaseous water cool off, it becomes liquid. So that water in the atmosphere cooled off and became liquid. When it became liquid, it came to be, started to run, uh, fall down on Earth, and we got thunderstorms. And as there were enough of those thunderstorms that were just happening and happening and happening and happening, we formed oceans. Oceans are basically just gigantic puddles that formed because of all of these thunderstorms. Then lightning started to strike in these thunderstorms. And here's where something really important happened. When that lightning started to strike, 
these gases in the atmosphere that were really very simple molecules actually got struck with the lightning and the lightning gave them the energy that they needed to create organic molecules. Remember at the very beginning of the year we talked about inorganic molecules are those little tiny ones like carbon dioxide and water. Those are inorganic molecules. Organic molecules are our big ones. So the organic molecules we've talked about the most are your proteins, your fats, your carbohydrates, your nucleic acids. We didn't get anything that big yet but the lightning came in and we created these organic molecules. This has actually been replicated in the lab. There are scientists who've done this. They've taken the elements that we know were in Earth's early atmosphere, they've shot electricity in, and they've created organic molecules on that. So what we got were these things called proteinoid microspheres. So proteinoid, protein means protein, oid means ish. Oid is the science word for ish. So proteinoid means protein-ish, so kind of like proteins. Microspheres, micro means small, sphere we know means one of these. Okay, so micro, uh, proteinoid microspheres, so protein-ish little spheres formed. So what they were, were just really big organic molecules that were inside these membrane bubbles. After those proteinoid microspheres formed, somehow something happened that RNA then formed. So we had the proteins first, and then RNA formed from the protein. Over millions and millions of years then, we went backwards in DNA form. So you should be thinking about, wait a minute, when I learned this, I learned all about DNA. And I learned about how DNA gets transcribed into RNA. And then RNA makes a protein. Well, originally, the very first time this happened, that actually happened in reverse. We started with proteins, RNA happened, and then DNA happened. Three and a half billion years ago, single-celled prokaryotes formed. So prokaryotes are our organisms. If you remember way back, there are cells that don't have nuclei. They're living organisms that don't have nuclei. There's no nucleus in there. It's just a cell membrane, basically, with DNA floating around in it. These guys were anaerobic, and the reason they were anaerobic is that there was almost no free oxygen to use in the atmosphere. So that O2 that we breathe in and breathe out all the time, that wasn't in the atmosphere yet. We just didn't have it. It wasn't there, okay? So very little free oxygen to use. Um, that means that they had to live without oxygen. So they had to do what they needed to do without oxygen. That meant that they were doing that fermentation process. Well, you should know that performing photosynthesis or going through that um, that process of creating their own food uh, created oxygen because we know photosynthesis, we know that some things come in, some things go out. One of the things that goes out is oxygen. What's ironic, uh, well actually we'll get to the ironic part in the middle, in a minute. So that newly created free oxygen, that oxygen combined with the iron that was in the ocean. So there's all this iron floating around in the oceans. Well when you take oxygen and iron, what happens? Think about if you leave your bike out in the rain. Oxygen and iron oxidize and you get rust. And so all of that iron rusted and fell down to the ocean floor. When it fell down to the ocean floor, that's where we got iron ore. So all that iron that we go dig up as iron ore, that's how it got to be down there. Once all the iron got taken out, the ocean changed from this really gross reddish brownish color to the beautiful blue green that we think of. The methane and hydrogen sulfide levels that were out in the atmosphere decreased and ozone formed. So ozone is just three oxygens hooked together. So OOO is ozone. That ozone formed, when the ozone formed, that's that layer around our earth and now our sky turned blue. So all the, all the levels of yucky stuff came down and we got kind of a little bubble around ourselves. And so now we've got blue oceans and blue skies. Now, here's the ironic part. Those oxygen levels, when that oxygen level rose, and now we've got our ozone, which is trapping all that oxygen in, those anaerobic bacteria couldn't live with oxygen. So when those oxygen levels rose, some of those organisms actually died. They actually killed themselves by going through their own processes because oxygen was a waste product. They basically poisoned themselves with their waste product. So that oxygen caused some of those organisms to die. But we know because of, how, because of the competitive exclusion principle and all of those kinds of things that there are other options. Death isn't the only option. One other option is evolving and another one is to move. So some of the organisms moved. They just moved down to the bottom of the ocean and they went to those hydrothermal vents and they survived just fine in places where there isn't oxygen. 
Um, and then some of them evolved. So at some point, some, one of those little prokaryotes evolved so that it could use oxygen. All the other prokaryotes pointed left and called names until that one survived and everybody else died off. And when that one survived, it made babies, and then there were more like it. And then that happened over and over and over again, and those guys are the ones who survived because they could live where there was oxygen. The next thing that happened is some of those prokaryotes formed inner cell membranes. So they had their cell membrane, and then they got their inner cell membrane. What do you think that was the precursor for? Hmm, outer membrane, inner membrane. Hmm, that was kind of the, the beginning of our nucleus. Um, what happened then, and this is really trippy, is that some of the other prokaryotes, the ones that didn't have their own membranes, looked at the ones that did have their own membranes, and they thought, hmm, we could probably work together. And so some prokaryotes actually climbed inside of the other prokaryotes. They went in there. They didn't get eaten. They weren't getting digested. They went inside. And when they were inside, what they found was that it worked really, really well. They could live mutualistically. So since they could live mutualistically, and it worked for both of them, that's where eukaryotes came from. So we've got this nucleus that formed, and then we've got this other dude who climbed inside and helped him out. So mutualism happened. We've got these two things living symbiotically. This is where our eukaryotes came from, or our cells with nuclei. Uh, we actually think that um, this is how chloroplasts and mitochondria came to be. Uh, current endosymbiotic theory says that uh, mitochondria used to be their own organisms. Chloroplasts used to be their own organisms. But at some point, mitochondria and chloroplasts actually climbed inside of some other cells, and that's where we got these more complex cells that we think about. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, especially since we know that mitochondria have their own DNA. Remember, they have their own special DNA. We talked about how you get that from your mom. Totally makes sense. So endo means in, symbiosis means living together. So endosymbiotic means living together one inside the other. So it's our theory that some prokaryotes climbed inside of the other prokaryotes, and now that's where we got our modern eukaryotic cells. That was 1.6 billion years ago. Here's where things get interesting. Some of those eukaryotes evolved to reproduce sexually. And when they reproduced sexually, that increased variation. And when you increase variation, you increase differences, which means there are way more options that are going to be fit for the environment. So you have way more choices in terms of what's going to work. And with that sexual reproduction and getting more variation and getting more what's going to work, you have a lot more things happening. So you've got much faster evolution. And so as things evolved then, cells started to find out, hey, if, if we start to work together, this is going to work better for everybody. And so we started to get these multicellular organisms. And then those multicellular organisms got more and more and more complex. And as they got more and more and more complex, they evolved more and more. And then here we are. Some people would say the human is the most evolved organism on Earth. I say that's garbage because we are terribly unfit for living in an ocean. Uh, we are terribly unfit for living in the sky or living in trees or things like that. Um, but we are pretty complex. So we've gone from what people call the primordial ooze, that slime of these proteinoid microspheres, all the way up to humans and great killer whales and gorillas and emus and uh, E. coli bacteria and all of the other very complicated things that we have out there. So there you go. Uh, 